What's up, students? Hope you're having the best day of your life today, you guys. Today, we're going to talk about resultants, concurrent forces. This is something that comes up in a number of different topics. I'm not sure exactly where to place this. A lot of teachers maybe start the year with resultants. Sometimes you'll see it first brought up in dynamics, things like that. But this is something you're going to see throughout the year at whatever point. So whenever you see something about resultants, don't think that there are different resultants in dynamics as there are somewhere else. I'm going to talk about exactly what it is so you'll understand when to use it, why we need to solve for them, and why resultants are so, so important when it comes to the mathematics of physics, how we're going to find the X and Y components of resultants, so essentially moving backwards from the resultant to its components. I'm going to show you examples of every way that I know of that you can solve for the resultant as well as the components. This is going to be awesome for anybody that's looking to take the SAT physics exam, the AP physics one, two, and even C. This is a foundation that's across all physics platforms, so you can use it regardless of the physics course you're in, especially in my home state, New York, for the Reeds exam. Let's dive into this. So the resultant is simply how it sounds. It's the result of vectors that act either concurrently or the sum of vectors that are acting inside a specific system. Okay, so the resultant is the result or sum of vectors. I think the most common one and the one you see first is going to be displacement. Usually we see displacement early on in the year where if I walk this way, then I walk this way, then I walk back down this way. This displacement is the result or the sum of all of these vectors. And we usually just call this capital R or sometimes you'll see it called A. And the way that we find the resultant is going to depend on how many vectors are present. Okay, is there one, two, three, et cetera? And also the angle that these vectors act at a certain time. So the first thing I want to look at and how we solve for the resultant is going to be forces that act at zero, 180, and 90 degrees. So this is going to be concurrent forces. Now remember, resultants can be for all different vectors, but first I'm going to talk about forces. And when I mean that it can deal with all different types of vectors, like I said, this could be a vector, two meters north, two meters west, two meters south, okay? These were all displacement vectors. So we find the result in the displacement, but when it comes to forces, there is something called concurrent forces, and this is going to be for zero degrees, this is going to be for 180 degrees, and this is going to be for 90 degrees, because these are going to be easy resultants to solve for. Here's what I'm talking about. Let's say I have a box right here. If I have two forces, force one, that's say three newtons, and I have the same exact force in the same exact direction of four newtons, these two act at zero degrees from each other. Now, when forces act at zero degrees, they sum. So in this case, R is going to be equal to three plus four, which is going to be equal to seven newtons. Now, this is also the F net for this particular situation. This is how we are gonna solve for F net at two forces that are acting on a mass at zero degrees. This is helpful in Newton's second law. If I knew the mass of this box, I can now tell the acceleration, but sometimes the resultant is also in forces known as F net. So if I was asked to draw that resultant, it would look like this. And oftentimes these vectors are used to generally represent the magnitude of that force, seven Newtons. At 180 degrees, now this is when they are pulling opposite to one another. If I have a four Newton force pulling this way, and I have a three Newton force pulling this way, I still say they're the sum, but these are opposite. So if I call it to the right positive, that means to the left has to be negative. It's still the sum, but now because this is going the opposite way, it's really R equals four plus minus three, which is going to be equal to one. And this one is positive, so it's to the right. So F net here is gonna be one Newton to the right. If I was asked to draw this ve uh, vector, it would look like this, one Newton. The last place that this happens is at 90 degrees because we know how to solve for things at 90 degrees. If this is four Newtons and this is three Newtons, 
Well, we can say that the result of these is going to be the sum of these two vectors. Now, as we see, it's not as obvious here. So I'm going to bring in some other different ways where you can see where they act concurrently because I'm not sure how would I draw this, which direction would I go? Well, remember, this is going to be the result of these two forces pulling on the box. So when the if this was like maybe a BB and not a box and these were the springs that were on a BB, which direction would the BB flow? That's essentially what the resultant path would be. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use something called the parallelogram method when two vectors are present. So the parallelogram is going to be an easy way to find the direction of a resultant when two vectors are present. And all we're going to do is we're going to take these two vectors and I'm going to turn them into a parallelogram. In this case, it's going to be a rectangle. Now I have this right here as my parallelogram. My resultant, and in this case my F net as well, is going to be in this direction here from the origin to this intersection point. And if I transpose this three Newtons over here, we see that now we have a right triangle, which is going to be three, four. So R in this case is going to be A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And for simplicity of math, I made this R is a three, four, five triangle. So the F net here or R is going to be five Newtons. And you can use the parallelogram for any vectors, not just at 90 degrees. So at 90 degrees we can solve, but like I said, the parallelogram method is more used for the direction. Let me give you an example of when they're not at zero, 180, or 90 degrees. So let's say I had an origin right here and I had a force that was going this way. And I had another force that was going this way. I don't know what their magnitudes are, but I want to know the direction of their resultant. So once again, all I'm going to do is I'm going to turn these two vectors into a parallelogram. And this is generally just going to be a rough sketch, guys. So now I can use this parallelogram method to say that my R is going to be here. And what this does is also shows that it's going to be stronger than both of my vectors individually. Whenever there is an acute angle, R is going to be bigger. When it's obtuse, then R will be smaller. Here's what I'm saying. If these two angles, if these two vectors are obtuse, if I draw the parallelogram now, we see that it's a smaller version of this particular R. So the parallelogram method shows direction, but sometimes that direction can be solved for if it's at zero, 180, or 90 degrees. The largest resultant we can have is zero degrees. The smallest resultant we can have is 180 degrees. Not all force pairs have a smallest amount of zero. So every single resultant that three and four Newtons can produce must be somewhere between one Newton. So it must be greater than or equal to one. R must be inside this particular zone of seven and one. That is the range of resultants for these particular vectors. Now, what if we have more than three vectors? And well, then we really couldn't use the parallelogram, so we're going to use another method. This method is commonly called the tip to tail. And essentially, when we have a vector, we have an arrowhead, and I am going to call that the tip of the arrow. This is going to be known as the tail of the arrow. So when I'm given a bunch of vectors, I'm going to align them tip to tail. Now you can do this with two vectors. Let me show you really simple. So if I have these two vectors, one and two, vector one and vector two, if I align these tip to tail, so I'm gonna draw vector one exactly like it'd be shown, V1. Now I take the tail of two and I put it at the tip of one and I draw that vector, V2. Now I have the direction of R from here to here. And that would have been the same exact if I did a parallelogram. But now what happens when I have three different forces acting? For example, if I wanted to find the resultants of this, vector one, vector two, and vector three, 
I would have to use the tip to tail method. And the good thing about the tip to tail method, it does not matter which vector you start with or the order that you place them. So for example, I can start with V3. Then maybe I want to draw V2. Then I draw V1. The resultant of those three can now be drawn from the start, the tail of the first, to the tip of the last. This is your R and it needs a vector head. So we find the direction of the resultant by using the parallelogram method, if it only has two, or the tip to tail if it has more. That's gonna give you direction. And if those are placed at zero, 90, and 180, we can find the exact value of the resultant as well. Now you can find the value of the resultant if it's not at zero, 180, and 90, but that takes a little bit more work and a protractor. I'm gonna show you how to do that. It doesn't come up very often in basic physics courses, but I wanna show you that it can be done. Okay, and this is just a, it's essentially just a scale model. Let's say that one box, this distance right here, is equal to two Newtons. So if I had two vectors acting, let's say it was vector one and vector two. So let's say we have vector one and vector two. Now you see for vector one, it's easy because these are right through the boxes. We know that this is four Newtons. Now we see with vector two, it's not as obvious, right? Because it cuts through these. So what we're gonna need to do is we're going to need to measure this and not just take the amount of boxes. So we'd need like a ruler. Now when I took a ruler, I'd measure this, let's say that it came out to like five Newtons, all right? So we just did this as a scale drawing. The next thing we would need to do is we would need to measure this angle from the horizontal. I'm gonna call this theta one. So in my tip to tail, my scale drawing, now I would draw V2 using a ruler. So this length would represent this scale right here. So I would draw V2 exactly like it was at angle one. I would then draw V1 to scale at the angle it is from the horizontal as well, which is easy to see, that's just 90 degrees. Then I would draw the resultant. Now that resultant would have an arrowhead I'd call it R, and what I'd then have to do is I'd have to measure this R, apply it to my scale to get its magnitude, and then I would need to use a protractor, and I would need to measure this theta too. And that's how you do a scale tip-to-tail drawing. So the last is now a resultant in reverse. And these are known as finding X and Y components. And this really shows why we need to do this. When we do math, guys, we deal only in one dimension at a time to make things easy. Well, if I give you a resultant, say like this, and I said this resultant has a magnitude of 50 newtons, and that 50 newtons was, say, 37 degrees from the horizontal. This is usually seen first in projectile motion. And the thing we realize is that I can't use this resultant to solve for range and solve for height because this resultant is a little bit up and a little bit over. But we also know from the parallelogram method, if I go in reverse, that this is the result of some vector here. And it's the result of this vector here. Right, if I give you these two vectors, you do the parallelogram method, you find R. Now I'm giving you R, and I wanna know what are these two vectors, and these are the important vectors in a projectile motion for height. If it's force, these would be how much force is pulling an object upwards, how much force is pulling an object to the right. So as this is called the resultant, this is called the Y component of the resultant, and this is called the X component of the resultant. Now, because this isn't unique to forces or displacement or velocities and can be used for any resultant, I can't really call this F. I'm just going to call this capital A. So the resultant is going to be A in this case, and I'm going to call this AX, and I'm going to call this AY, just so we can use it across all different topics and all different variables.
So how do we solve for these X and Y variables? Well, if I transpose AY over to here, we see that we now have a wonderful right triangle that looks something like this. So A, AY, and AX are fancy physics terms. We need to relate them to what we learn when we learn trigonometry to the fancy math rules. And the fancy math rules were opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. So if we look at the fancy math terms and we look at trigonometry, Sokotoa, as our mnemonic, the sine of angle is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. But now let's put in the fancy physics terms. Opposite is really AY, hypotenuse is really A. So if I want to find AY, I would just take A and multiply it by the sine of theta. Now I can use this AY in any formula that deals with the Y direction. The same can be true for the X direction. The cosine of theta equals the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Those are, uh, those are fancy math words. Let's make them physics. So we see the same thing. This is really AX and this is really A. So to find AX, I just take A times the cosine of theta. Now I can solve for the range by using this. We must remember that A, AX, and AY they all have the same units. So if this was a velocity, the X and Y components would both be in meters per second as well. If this was a displacement, then the X and Y components would each have a unit of meters. You need to do this for any vector at an angle when doing math and physics. This right here is the most important thing that you're going to learn when it comes to angles for the entire year as well as resultants. You guys will see this put to practice throughout the entire year in all the videos that I do with all types of angles. If you have any questions about this video specifically, leave them down in the comments below. Until I see you on the next one, guys, always stay positive, work really, really hard, and, and geez, be kind to other people. I'll see you on the next one.